Good morning and welcome to Rising. We have a fantastic show for you today filled with holiday cheer. The uh, usual Friday hosts have all disappeared. Maybe they're off saving Christmas. So I am happy to fill in and happy to be here with you, Jessica. And you are looking very festive, I must say. I'm feeling very festive, Robbie. <laughs> it's our last show before Christmas. We're going to have a good time. I know that we are. Well, we've got a lot of Trump-related news to get to. Why don't you take it away? Yes. On Thursday, Detroit News released excerpts from an audio recording purportedly featuring statements from former President Trump and Republican National Committee Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel. According to the report, the recording revealed Trump and McDaniel assuring canvassers Monica Palmer and William Hartman that legal representation would be arranged for them if they chose not to certify the election results. During a phone call dated November 17, 2020, Trump is said to have urged Palmer and Hartman, stating, we must stand up for our country. We cannot allow these individuals to wrest our country away from us. Mm. Meanwhile, special counsel Jack Smith responded to former President Donald Trump's request to postpone the Supreme Court's examination of his claim to criminal immunity in a forceful filing. Last week, the Supreme Court accepted special counsel Jack Smith's plea to address the matter of presidential immunity following Judge Tanya Chutkan's dismissal of two motions from Trump's legal team based on First Amendment and presidential immunity arguments. In reaction, Trump and his legal team submitted a request asking the court to await a ruling from the lower appeals court on the matter. And on Thursday, Smith filed a vigorous reply opposing Trump's motion and delivering a sharp rebuke, writing, the charges here are of the utmost gravity. This case involves, for the first time in our nation's history, criminal charges against a former president based on his actions while in office. The nation has a compelling interest in a decision on the respondent's claim of immunity from these charges, and if they are to be tried, a resolution by conviction or acquittal without undue delay. On top of all of this, Colorado's Supreme Court decision to keep Trump off of the ballot in that state is fueling the fire for blue states seeking to do the same. Democrats in Michigan, Maine, and California are already pulling the levers to see if they can follow suit. So and, there's... Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Robin. I was just gonna, and I was just gonna add, um, if all of that wasn't enough, um, Ed Meese, the former uh, former Attorney General under Reagan, I believe, submitted a friend of the court brief that I found very interesting that argues um, that uh, Jack Smith lacks standing to bring this legal action against Donald Trump uh, because the Merrick Garland's appointment of him was not based on any statutory authority granted to the office of the attorney general. Again, that's just one argument to throw into the mix, but I saw a lot of uh, you know people in, uh, in uh, conservative legal circles um, circulating that um, information on social media, the argument that this is all illegitimate for that reason. So, uh, so there's that, uh, but obviously there's Trump facing you know legal jeopardy for numerous reasons. Um, and including now in Michigan and uh, and <laughs> efforts to keep him off the ballot entirely. Um, you know, where where do you weigh in on the can, can Trump's name even appear on the ballot argument that Colorado has suddenly foisted upon all of us? I was honestly surprised to see this happen because, listen, we know Supreme Court justices at the state level even are making a calculation what will be the impact of this ruling as much as they want to say that they are purely interpreting the law. We know that they're human beings. We know that they're thinking what's well, going to be the backlash if Trump is taken off of the ballot in a state like Cor Colorado, which is not like super comfortably blue. There are a lot of rural areas that are comfortably red in the state. There are people who really support Donald Trump in Colorado. And so I think in making this decision, they made some kind of calculation about what the political backlash would be. And they said, you know what? We actually think the, the 14th Amendment applies. And what's interesting is the dissenting judges at the state level in Colorado, they made an argument around how this wouldn't be legal per the state laws of Colorado. So if Trump's legal team decides to appeal this to a higher court, they're going to have a tough case to make based on everything that was written and how this case was decided because those justices didn't really make a case for how this would shake out on the federal level. They basically dissented on the grounds of this would violate our state laws. So this might end up holding up in a higher court if his legal team decides to appeal.
Yeah, well, I, I think I'm certainly the Supreme Court is going to be asked to weigh in on this. Um, I think probably the weakest area of the Colorado case and what this may hinge on, well, so there's the technical argument that the oath that the president takes is not the one covered by Section 3. Um, we interviewed Alan Dershowitz about this yesterday, um, briefly, before it descended into an argument about Israel-Palestine. Uh, people can check out that segment if they like. But uh, he found that <laughs> argument to be the least convincing. Uh, what he said, and, and what I tend to think think is that the insurrect the specific insurrection language in the in the uh, in, in the uh the, the 14th Amendment is going to be perhaps not read to cover Trump's action. I mean, he's not been, A, he's not been convicted of insurrection. And then re really what he's accused of is, you know, trying to remain in office via extra legal means that may in fact be criminal. But whether that's, I mean, insurrection, insurrectionary activity to me, uh, com like involves uh, the seizing of arms, the like actual violence, um, revolution, that kind of thing. Whereas Trump was using questionable legal maneuvers that again might might reflect some underlying criminality, but is not the kind of thing the people who wrote the Fourteenth Amendment had in mind. They had in mind like an actual army that was you know that was mustered against the United States. Yeah, the, the people who wrote the 14th Amendment couldn't foresee Trump posting on social media <laughs> talking about the folks that were at the Capitol on January 6th. I think it's an it's interesting to think of his leadership on that day, what he was directing people to do, what now we know he knew was happening on the day of January 6th and, and didn't want to call in the National Guard, was kind of cheering them on, encouraging them at the Capitol for many hours while this was happening. Does that mean he was inciting an insurrection? If he's the leader of it, if he inspired it, if he gave a speech there and then they marched onto the Capitol afterwards only to break in and, and try and steal those, those electoral votes, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not a legal scholar. I can see a case being made, mm. though. And I'm not sure what the makeup is of a lot of these uh, state Supreme Courts but I can definitely see when it comes to 2024, Trump being off the ballot in a great number of states. But the appellate process is also very long. It can take up to three years. Uh, I think average for appeals for capital cases are, uh, you know, 966 days. So I'm not sure this would take as long, right? Trump is not facing the death sentence here. But there is a ton of evidence to review in a case like this. And it's an extremely high profile case. I'm sure everyone working on it will want to be very careful, and that can be very timely. Mm. Well, we will see which of these legal traps Trump is able, is able to step over or whether they trip him up. And I actually have a radar today. I will get into that next. Stay tuned. More Rising right after this.